So this is Kelly, and she's a destroyer, a devourer. That doesn't mean she's bad, by the way. It means she's something to contend with. She's like Tiamat, so I'm going to take her apart so that you can see her, because you can't unless, unless you, you know, happen, happen to know what this means because of your culture. And even then, you might not be able to see it. So let's figure it out. Well, she has eight legs. Why? What has eight legs? Spider. spider. How do you all feel about spiders? Yeah. Right. And the reason you feel like that is because you have these little spider detectors on your skin. Those are basically hairs. And when the spider crawls along in the spider detectors, you get this creepy feeling, and that's you basically shaking your skin to get rid of the damn spider. Of course, you can't do that anymore because you're not a horse. You know, so you just kind of have a vestigial feeling like that. And spider can give you a good chomping, you know. And so sometimes that's actually poisonous, and that's not so good. But also a spider is an interesting thing from a conceptual perspective, because it spins a web. And the web catches things that aren't paying attention. And then the thing that isn't paying attention gets wrapped up in the spider's web, and then it gets sucked dry. And so that's a spider. Okay, so she's a spider. Now, spiders are pretty cool, too, because they can spin webs, you know, and that's the web of fate, by the way. That's the web of fate. Um, so that's one thing. She's a, she's a spider. And then, well, she's in this web, but the web is made out of fire, because that's fire. And then inside the fire, those are skulls. So she's a spider that sits in a web of fire and skulls. So believe me, if you saw a spider like that, you'd be looking at it. You might scream first, and maybe you would run away, but then you'd come back and look at it. It's like, oh, look, I found a spider. It's in a web of fire and skulls. It's like, that'd be very attractive to you. You probably wouldn't be able to forget about it. And, you know, that's one thing about Kelly. She's the bunch of things that you bloody well cannot forget about. And so you could actually even say, she's a model of all those things that you can't forget about. And then you could say, well, she's an attempt to model all those things you can't forget about. And you might say, well, why would you want to model those things? Well, it's because you bloody well better remember those things or you're not going to stay alive. And then you might ask, well, should you be dealing with the things that you shouldn't forget about one by one? Fire, say? Or, or, or skeletons? Should you be dealing with that one on one? Or spiders or snakes? Or should you be dealing with that as a category? Right? That's the thing about human beings is we like to deal with things as categories, because that way you can solve a whole bunch of problems at the same time. You know, so you might say, you do this all the time. You don't... If you go on, on, online and you look at people who, are having, who want advice about relationships, they want advice about relationships. And you think, well, really what they want is to figure out how to deal with this female or this male. But they don't ask that question. They ask, how can I improve my relationships? Which is that they're trying to solve the problem of how to relate to all the, the set of all potential relationships right now. Because maybe that's better information than exactly what to do about this particular male or female at this particular point in time. Now often it isn't, but you can understand why people push for that. It's like, why not get the general answer if you can? Then you solve the whole class of problems. Okay, so what's the class of problems here? The class of problems here is the class of problems. It's how do you conceptualize the class of problems? It's a brilliant, that's such a brilliant question. You know, it, for, for, I mean, maybe you can't. Maybe there's no commonality between all those things that constitute a problem. But by the same token, maybe there is. Well, this is an attempt to do that. Okay, so what else about Kelly? She's got a sword, her hair is on fire. She also has a headband of skulls. Now, people don't like skulls very much, you know. Um, they creep us out. And there's good reason for that, because all things considered, you should probably avoid places where there are a lot of skulls. Because it's easy to infer from that that a lot of people like you died there. And that might be because there's something around that's going to kill you, just like it killed all those other things, or there's some illness, or whatever. It's like, get the hell out of there. So, even chimps don't like chimp heads, and they don't like immobile chimp bodies. So, you know, a skull for us, it's like, well, you can see it's death itself, you know, and it is that. But it's an archetypal symbol, and you don't get accustomed to skulls. It's very, very hard. So, she's got skulls everywhere. Well, sometimes she has the tongue of a tiger, but she doesn't in this particular 
representation, but sometimes she does, and that's the predatory element. And the tiger, that's a pretty fascinating thing, right? Because it's like 12 feet long and 5 feet high, and you know, it's a major piece of engineering that, and probably it will eat you. So, to put the tiger's tongue on Kali also indicates that she's representative of those terrible, awe-inspiring, predatory things that lurk in the forest. This, of course, this is an Indian representation. She often has a, a snake around her waist, and usually it's a cobra. You know, and cobras are another thing that people find absolutely fascinating, like fire. And then, but not in this situation. What she has wrapped around her instead are intestines. And you see how her belly's hollow? She just gave birth to that unfortunate character that she happens to be standing on, and it's his intestines that she's eating. Right. Now, I fail to see how this symbol can protect you from death anxiety. You know, quite the contrary. It seems to me to be something that would seriously evoke it. You know, and, and there's no patriarchal protection here, and I can't see how anybody could use this to oppress the peasants. You know, maybe they could scare them with it, but that isn't actually how Kelly is used, so I don't think that that's a useful way of thinking about it at all. Now, interestingly enough, Kelly is something you make sacrifices to. Now, that's cool, eh? Because it's weird. People have had a hard time figuring out the whole idea of sacrifice. So there was this guy who was a journalist in the 1960s, and he wrote a book. His name was Arthur Kessler. And he wrote a book called The Ghost in the Machine, which is a book about consciousness. And one of the things he pointed out was that the motif of sacrifice seemed to be archetypal. It was universal. It was happening everywhere. And one of the side effects of that was human sacrifice. The gods were all upset. You'd sacrifice a couple of slaves or captures or children, because the Carthaginians used to do that all the time, their own children, and they'd have them smile before they killed them. So it was brutal, brutal, but the Carthaginians, they would commit suicide at the drop of a hat, because their basic idea was if you screwed up, well, you're wrong, time to kill yourself. There's no hope for you. So it was a very common idea, you know, and the Japanese still practiced that before World War II as well. It's like so. So anyway, so the whole idea of sacrifice, pretty damn dark, you know, and, and Kessler regarded it as evidence that the human race was basically insane, like in a fundamental, biological manner that was not fixable. So it was like the ultimate in original sin theorizing. You know, and that was written when everybody was all shorted out about the fact that we were going to blow ourselves up with nuclear weapons, and so the idea that humans were basically insane, which... It's not a bad theory, you know, and you could even say we're, we've been driven insane by the nature of being. Anyways, you make sacrifices to Kelly. They're often blood sacrifices. Now that's kind of interesting because one of the things that you might notice about what Kelly represents, which you might say is the predatory, like almost diabolical side of nature, you know, the part of nature that's really working hard at doing you in, is that it does seem to thrive on blood. And so there's an idea here, which is if you give the damn thing what it wants, maybe it will leave you alone. But there's a more sophisticated idea right beneath that, because what happens if you sacrifice to Kelly, is she turns into her opposite. And her opposite is, well, it's the opposite of this. It's benevolent nature. It's the kind of nature that, that environmentalists believe in. You know, it's like nature as French Impressionist landscape. It's not mosqui mosquitoes and guinea worms and cancer and crocodiles and gangrene. It's, you know, it's, it's a sunny day in an old growth forest where, you know, Disney deer are bouncing around smiling at you. You know, and that's nature too, because nature is what gives. And if you use the, femi the feminine symbolism, I mean, your mother is certainly someone who can be an absolutely horrific force, and that often happens to infants, but by the same token, she's the bearer of everything that pulls you into life. You know, and her, her contact with you, her physical contact, her ability to play with you, the fact that she looks at you, the fact that she feeds you directly from her body. It's like that's the whole opposite of Kelly the Destroyer. And they're both elements of the feminine. And part of the reason I think that it's the feminine per se that came to represent the destructive element of nature as well as the positive element is that men experience women in many ways as the destructive element of the feminine. Because men are always being rejected by women. And women are nature. Because nature is what selects you to reproduce. And so the answer for most women to most men is, 
you're a nice enough guy, but there's no way your genes should propagate themselves into the future. You know, and that's as harsh a judgment as can possibly be rendered. If you watch Crumb, for example, which I would highly recommend because it's full of great mother symbolism, is he's, he describes himself as someone who's so much of a loser, he's not even in the dominance hierarchy. You know, he's not at the bottom. He's outside, you know, so he describes himself as someone for, it was, especially him and his older brother, it was virtually impossible for them to even conceive of the idea that they might ask a girl in high school out. It wasn't that they would get refused, it was that it was inconceivable that they could even do it. That's where they were in the dominance arc. So, of course, Crumb, and who has a mother to go with it, you know, all his females are like these extremely physically powerful bird-headed goddesses, more or less, and he construes himself as this little warped thing that's, you know, sort of cowering at their feet, and it's deeply embedded in him. And no wonder, so given his circumstances, it's no wonder he actually did a remarkable job of, of developing himself in a, in, a, in a productive manner, I think, given what he had to go against. But anyways, the idea is you sacrifice to Kelly and you bring forth its opposite. Now, it's I was, once I thought, I thought I understood, I thought that I had come to understand the idea of sacrifice. I think I figured this out about 15 years ago. It just blew, about blew me over when I figured it out. Because it had always been viewed either as a kind of an epiphenomena or as something that's pathological. But it's not. It's the most remarkable, it's one of the most remarkable conceptual discoveries that the human race has ever made. Because what it meant was we started to figure out that if you gave something what it wanted, if you gave something something of value, then you could turn it into something that might be beneficial to you. So it's the it's it's the concomitant of delayed gratification, because delayed gratification is a sacrifice. So you know the 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 marshmallow experiment, right? Okay. So you get these little kids and you torture them. You say, look, hey, hey, you like marshmallows? It's like, yeah, I know you do. Okay, so here's a bunch of them. Now, if you don't eat those marshmallows, you get to have more marshmallows. And so, then you leave, and some of the kids eat the marshmallows, right? And you've got to admit, those kids, there's something about them. They get the damn marshmallows. You know, and so if there was an earthquake, right then, those kids would have won. Okay, so that's something to think about, because delaying gratification is not always the right answer. The environment has to be stable enough so that the probability that you will get what you've delayed for is high. And so if you're living in sheer chaos, you're a fool to delay gratification. It's like, eat the damn marshmallow now. So, so it's not like delayed gratification is the solution for everything. It's not. But sometimes it's the solution. So what do you do? You make a sacrifice now. And the idea is it will pay off in the future. So then you think about that in archetypal forms. It means that you forego something of value now. It's a sacrifice. You let go of it. And the deal is, if you let go of it, better things will happen to you in the future. And, you know, no other animal has figured that out. Well, squirrels maybe. You know, because they store nuts, but I don't really believe that they... I think it's fundamentally an instinct. You know, you know what I mean? I don't think they generalized from that idea. They do act it out. But I don't think they've generalized from it. They haven't turned it into a concept. And so the concept here is the world is constituted such that it has a tremendously destructive element. But if you can barter with that properly, then you can flip it over and the part of it that's positive will, will reveal itself. It's like, that's bloody brilliant. It's unbelievably brilliant. And there's even another element to it. Because let's say that... All, you're, all you've been getting from reality for a while is Kelly. It's all spiders and snakes and fires and skull, you know, it's, and, and things that want to eat you. You might think, why is that? And one answer is, well, that's just what it's like. But then that's a problem, because that's not just what it's like. You know that the opposite is there, and you might say, well, where, where the hell is that? Like, why is it hiding its face from me? And one answer is, I, reality is, cannot be contended with. That's one answer. But that's like you're depressed and hopeless as soon as that happens. It's like you're done. Here's another answer. You might be doing something wrong. 
And then you might think, well, what would it mean to be doing something wrong? And then we might say, maybe you're hanging on to something you value a little too tightly. Maybe one of your axiomatic presuppositions, like the thing that's at the top of your damn value structure, is actually sufficiently outdated or pathological, such that if you hold on to it, all you're going to get is frowns and misery. So maybe you have to let it go. Now it's a sacrifice. And so maybe that's why the rule is when you're making sacrifices to Kelly, or any other god for that matter, is don't sacrifice the low quality junk. You sacrifice the stuff that you're attached to. Because if things aren't going right, it could be that it's because you're attached to the wrong things. Now that's interesting. That's starting to get very interesting because that means that people are starting to think, maybe my attitude has something something I could change. Like maybe it's not just the factual nature of the external world. It's something I could contend with and dance with. And maybe if I readjusted my moral schema, the probability is kind of low that Kelly will be there all the time, and it'll be pretty high that her positive counterpart shows up. So then the question might be, how do we set, make the sacrifices that are necessary to organize our schema of interpretation and behavior such that when we implement it in the world, Reality shines its positive face on us and not its negative face. And like that's an incredibly complicated problem, right? I mean, that's like that's a problem human beings have been trying to figure out, and animals for that matter, forever. You know, it wasn't until there were human beings that we started to get some conceptual representation of it. But then the other thing too is you guys are all doing that. You have a big bet going with nature. And the bet is Make some sacrifices right now. Or maybe your parents are making sacrifices on your behalf. And what's the bet? The bet is, it'll be worth it. But what does that mean? It means that if you make the proper sacrifices, you discipline yourself, you don't, you're not too dissolute with your resources, you pay attention, and you wait, your life will be better. Well, that's pretty cool, because it might be true. And if it's true, then none of this is an illusion or delusion. It's just low resolution, first pass representation. And that's smart. And so, you know, from a Piagetian perspective, well, what do you do before you understand something? You act it out. And so the people that are making sacrifices, they're acting out this idea. Do they know the idea? Depends on what you mean by know. No, they're acting it out. They're dramatically representing it. Is that knowledge? Well, it's a form of knowledge. You know? Is it the kind of abstract knowledge that we're talking about right now? No. But it's the immediate precursor to that. You don't get from the phenomena to the articulation without running it through some bodily representations and some drama. And this is so damn complicated that you, know, you probably couldn't get to it until you had civilizations that were pretty damn good and lots of people thinking about this all the time. You know, and so the person who came up with this, they would have experienced it as a religious revelation. It's like, what's the nature of reality? Poof, you get this image, you know, it's of this multi-armed goddess, and it's, it's in flames, and it's in a web, and it's like terrifying you. It's terrifying you. You're gripped by it, and you make a representation. And part of the reason you worship it is because the bloody thing has got you in its grip. And no wonder, because there is an idea behind that that's so powerful that you should be gripped by it. You should be unable to forget it. Because it's, a, it's an absolute, it's a stellar stroke of genius. It's a real revelation. And it sets the whole human race on the path to making the proper sacrifices so that the fire and the bugs and the insects and the snakes and the tigers stay the hell away. And a good thing. It's a good thing. And then maybe now and then, you know, the world's configured so that it's beneficial to us.